something new about the combat Twilight Princess that I can't believe I forgot to mention until now was it introduced the rolling attack. Well, Minish Cap also had that. I guess I guess it came from Minish Cap then. It was just introduced to this game. Like basically you roll then you attack at the end of a roll. It's weird. Like in in Wind Waker, when you would run ahead, it said attack and not roll. Like you can clearly see it says roll in this game when you're running ahead, and that makes a lot more sense. It almost feels like saying attack in Wind Waker for roll was a mistranslation that they just decided to keep. But yeah, you have the roll attack and I can think of a few instances where that's useful, like when you have to run up to an enemy quickly before it teleports away, like like Zant in the Goron Mines platform part of his boss fight. Other than that, it's pretty much useless, so no wonder I forgot about it. I just like to spam the spin attack. I guess the Helm Splitter does more damage, but you have no way of knowing how much damage any individual attack does because there's no there's no hero's charm or anything. So I have no motivation to use fancy moves if I don't have to, because how am I supposed to know what the reward for that is? And it takes a while to attack an enemy with Helm Splitter. You have to you have to watch Link jump over him and attack him. It's quicker to just spin attack him. This is the first 3D Zelda game where Link wears chainmail rather than just having tights. It looks pretty good. I don't know why they didn't have this before. I guess it was graphical limitations. Like, see? See here? How is this not glitchy? He's going entirely the wrong way from we're bashing him. He should he should be going backwards in relation to Link. Instead he goes to the side. It's very glitchy. Meanwhile, it's still raining. Not sure why. I mean I guess it's supposed to be uh, establishing a bleak atmosphere, but it doesn't do it nearly as well as with a link with a link to the past intro. It doesn't have nearly as much a feeling of dread with the rain. Maybe it's because it's not nearly dark enough. Like, you look at the sky and the clouds are still bright. It's not like the clouds are dark or anything. So, it doesn't have a dark lighting. If King Bubblin's able to talk, why didn't he talk from the very beginning? And why isn't she commenting on him talking when she does that later? That's stupid. And like, you notice, well I didn't get to show it off, but she had a line commenting on the mini boss of Lake Fed Temple, but why doesn't she talk about him? It's lazy. And it was also lazy in this boss fight because it's literally the same boss fight you fought before Arbor's Grounds. Is he invincible? How are you the, I mean, you're a stronger guy in the sense that you're more agile. Well, he's too slow to really do anything to you. But... I don't think Link would be able to survive being defeated in fights so many times the way he was defeated. I like this. This perspective on the orcs. Well, it's like, he's supposed to be a King Bublin, but he looks nothing like the Bublins. So why is he called King Bublin if he's not a Bublin? He's an orc. But I do like that perspective on the monsters. But they never really do that again. I really like Minna's line to it. Like she was shocked that he spoke. Even though this isn't the first time in Zelda that monsters have spoke. Like, all the way back in Zelda 1, monsters would speak to you. But yeah, that was the last appearance of King Bublin. It sure is a good thing that he decided to give you the key. Because if he didn't decide to... If he didn't arbitrarily decide that this was the time that he would give up, then Link probably would have been screwed. He would have just ran off and Link wouldn't have had the key. 
The monkey spirit, the monkey-like spirit in this game is in the shape of the Kokiri symbol with, with a scorpion tail, the way it bends around it. It looks spherical. Another thing about it is that it has a human face with, with some uncanny badly lip movements. And the annoying thing about Farron is that most of his dialogue is just what Ordana said. When you're not mashing the A button through the text of the Light Spirits, you'll notice that they have very slowly moving text. Which is especially glaring if you somehow don't know that you can mash the A button to make them talk faster. Or... Why is a yellow rupee in a giant chest? And yeah, I had to look up a guide to figure out how to get here. And I also had to look up a guide to figure out what to do here. And even then, I looked in a whole bunch of guides, and the only thing I could find was vague hints telling me which items I needed to use for this place. This is the only part of the dungeon that's actually dark enough to take advantage of the, the rains to properly give a bleak atmosphere. And even that does it too well, like whenever the game has dark lighting, it's too dark. And I followed, like, I must have followed the instructions correctly with that lighting message they give you every time you start up a uh, file or reload your file. Like, all the squares look a different shade of black or white from each other. So, it's not like I'm doing anything wrong. The game is actually supposed to look this dark. Yeah, this is just one big confusing mess. Like, it is good that they finally designed a puzzle around, like, the rain is putting out the torches, so you have to find a way to make the rain stop. I like this concept. It just, like, all the different puzzle set pieces are all over the place, so you have to figure out what to do with each one. And, like, I like how there's, there's hints here. But they weren't very helpful. It's good that there's there's spirits there, but I wouldn't have known that they were there. I wouldn't have known to look for them if I hadn't looked up a guide. It's easy to overlook that boulder because it's so dark and it blends in with the ground with the dark lighting. It's good that there's lantern oil in there because it would really suck if you got to this point and you're, you were out of lantern oil. Then you have to go all the way back. And there's lots of money in this dungeon too that doesn't really help you because you're at a point in the game where you can't spend on anything. The only thing you can use money on is magic armor. Although that's going to be tremendously useful when you're faced against the dark nut later on. Multiple of them in fact. Beta screenshots of the game implied that they would have more caves in this game, as well as different character designs, a really spindly demon in Farron Woods that you actually fight, and lots of different level design. It's like this game changed a lot from its first trailer. Another reason people probably are underwhelmed with the game is that it took such a long time for it to come out, that they just got fatigued of all the attention put on it. Like forces. Like Sonic Forces, for example. Because it got delayed. I hope this doesn't teach Sega to stop delaying games. Yeah, this is also confusing. Well, you never had to do this, ever. Putting... Putting two statues into squares and not holes, like with the Farron Woods. And putting two of them there at once. I wish that they had squares like that for all the puzzles rather than making you have to judge depth perception and judge how far away the the statues have to be from each other. How far away the statue has to be from the platform so you can jump onto it without overshooting it or undershooting it. Because that was really annoying in the desert. And like Midna popping up implies that the game expected you to somehow know how to get to the graveyard and expected you to, in a regular playthrough of Hyrule Castle that wasn't trying to do everything, get to the graveyard. It's like, why would they have Midna show up if it wasn't optional? 
but it, it's optional. So, the music in this place is based off of Only to the Past. Only to the Past Hyrule Castle music. It's ambient, but it's still an actual melody, which is good. It just that's not very epic until it gets higher up in the castle. Ocarina Time's Hyrule Castle dragged out because at the end of it you had the six trials that would test, like, it, it would test you with all sorts of different puzzles. It was kind of like the trials at the end of the Wind, Wake, Wind Waker Final Dungeon. But Twilight Princess's Hyrule Castle is more focused on combat, as you can see here. You're just refighting the same enemies you fought all game, and these are just overworld enemies. These aren't even enemies unique to dungeons. I like how the Triforce is kept very subtle in this game's plot. The only time like the only time it becomes a big focus is towards the end of the game, where all of a sudden Ganon shows up out of nowhere and then he demands the Triforce. Before that, all the emphasis was on the few shadows and the mirror of darkness that was suddenly introduced. Like, that's the thing, like, suddenly introduced. Like, the thing about long-running franchises is the longer they run, the harder it becomes to accept brand new concepts being introduced to the lore. Because you just start to think that it came out of nowhere because it was never alluded to in any of the past games that were released. So, for example, the Light Spirits, they seem to come out of nowhere because they were never mentioned in the previous games because they hadn't been thought up as a concept yet, and then all of a sudden you have this game that's very heavily focused on them. All of a sudden, no, they need to exist. They're a very mandatory part of the, the world. Then why, why didn't I hear about them earlier? Why did they choose not to appear to the Hero of Time? I guess they didn't need to because their existence was being threatened by Twilight Spirits that can apparently only attack... Like, apparently only the Shadow Beasts can attack them, and Ganon's regular minions couldn't. Like, did they summon the Light Spirits and make them vulnerable? Why would the Light Spirits be that stupid? But yeah, everything I've said about the Dark Knights I've already said, they're cheap, they're not properly designed around the combat. You're going to constantly attack its armor when you're trying to do the hidden skills. Oh, just do the hidden skills and you'll be fine, right? And you literally need to rely on the cutting grass attack that isn't for fighting enemies. That's the only way you're going to be able to attack them. Link's fancy sword chi thing introduced in this game, where you beat an enemy and then sheath right away, and then spend a whole bunch of time watching Link go, comes from the first reveal trailer for the game. They just decided to throw it into the game afterwards, I guess. The giant spiders that you fight in this game, like especially in the first dungeon, they would just hang there in Ocarina of Time. It was only in this game that they would decide to drop off their spider thread and actually run at you and be annoying because you constantly have your sword get stopped by them somehow. But in Ocarina of Time, you constantly... I constantly ran into the spiders because I couldn't judge how close I was to them. And, and every time you run into a Skulltella in Ocarina of Time, you get knocked back extremely far. As if Link is reacting to the first time he's ever been hit in his life. It's very obnoxious. I could have sworn that I had run into the wall in time, that he should have grabbed onto it and hung onto it, but he decided not to for some reason. This is a pretty inventive puzzle, and I also like being able to clutch onto the chandeliers, even if it is a bit finicky about where exactly you have to aim on them to clutch onto them. Sometimes the game will arbitrarily decide that you're not close enough to them to do it. I like how there's a blue carpet here instead of a red one, but the red one looks a lot better. So, you have to push on the nunchuck control stick in order to move in the report. It's not really sensitive enough. There are worse controls in general in the Wii port because of that. 
Because the analog stick isn't sensitive enough. You have to really push onto the analog stick in order to make it, in order to make you go in the right direction. I don't know why I thought that you need to use a ball and chain on these things. For some reason, I had a memory that you needed to do that. I'm not really sure why. Both rooms like this have specific puzzles to them that are pretty difficult to figure out. Like, you've never been expected to... Well, I guess you have because you had to use the bow and arrow on a rope to make a drawbridge fall down and go on mines. You had to do that twice, but you're trying to apply that logic to a much smaller painting on the wall. And you haven't done that puzzle once since then. And again, you have two of these guys at once. That's extremely dickish. One will attack you while you're trying to focus on the other, and both will block at the same time. It's not fun. I like how not only does Midna have voice acting, even if it is like Japanese gibberish that's sped up and stuff, but her voice acting also has pauses in it. So it feels a bit more like actual voice acting. Not that you'll really notice if you just mash A through the text, though, because then you'll only hear like snippets of it. The monkey you get the Gale Boomerang from is a baboon, which is a completely different species from monkeys, and yet somehow he's still considered the leader of the monkeys. It's really weird. I guess Hyrule is a world where the monkeys, as they get older, they become baboons. I guess baboons and monkeys are the same species in Hyrule, even though they look completely different. Yeah, that's how dickish the Dark Nuts are. They drain all of your rupees, even though you had hundreds of them. And again, I'm trying to use strategy with bombs, but look, they just instantly know when they're going to explode and jump away from them instantly, even though they're looking at you. So how could they possibly know exactly when the bombs are going to explode if they're looking at you the whole time? So... The Gale Boomerang has the Fairy of the Winds in it, which is the explanation for why it can create tornado. Why did the Fairy of the Winds agree to be trapped in the Boomerang for all eternity? Why didn't the item appear in Wind Waker, which was all about wind? Pressing A after throwing the Boomerang makes you roll forwards, potentially off a cliff, which is pretty annoying. There's actually a way to do the long jump attack with it in the Wii port, but it's only off of an enemy. And because of that, it's too unreliable to even be bothered with. So technically, the, the glitch is in the Wii port, it's just very hard to do, and not very worth it. I don't really like the design of the big key in this game. It, it looks pretty boring and bland. It's all dark and brown, and I don't like the way it's shaped. Wind Waker had the best big key design in the entire franchise. I like how golden it was and how it had horns. It looked a lot like the Link to the Past design. In the Wii port, when you use the slingshot or boomerang, you'll briefly see the words, point the Wiimote at the screen. It's very unnecessary in immersion breaking, and you can't turn that off either. 